Hi, welcome to Week in Review. I'm Phil O'Connor, the Enterprise Editor here at The Oklahoman. This is where we catch up on some of the headlines from the week and look ahead to what some of the stuff we have coming this weekend. Got three of our sharpest brains in the newsroom with me today. Have business energy writer uh, Adam Wilmeth, sports columnist Barry Trammell, and uh, reporter Ben Felder. Barry, let's get right to it. Big week in sports, big week for Sooner fans. Baker Mayfield's going to be coming back. And he's going to be coming back for two years. Well, yeah, the Big 12 uh, voted uh, on uh, Wednesday to, uh, to not give Baker Mayfield his extra year of eligibility and uh, reassembled the next day, said, let's think about this again, did get him the year of eligibility. So that makes 2017 look a lot better. Oklahoma plays uh, Ohio State on September 9th, 2017 in the horseshoe in Columbus. You want to go into that game with a uh, three-year starting quarterback, not a two-game starting quarterback. So uh, really no change for 2016, but it makes 2017 and the prospects look much better. Well, let's talk about that. Even though Oklahoma got good news in his return, fans are not happy about how the whole thing was handled. And there's still more talk again from the OU fandom about wanting out of the Big 12. Well, OU fans are not going to be happy with the Big 12. That's just the truth. Uh, it's, uh, it's a passionate, emotional uh, reaction from fans. Uh, if you took a vote of the fans, it'd be overwhelmingly to leave the conference. Uh, the grass is always greener. They see Texas A&M leave. They see Nebraska leave. They say, hey, why can't we leave to get out of, the, out of the thumb of Texas, University of Texas. But the truth is, the things you don't like about Texas, which sort of exerts its, its force on people, the Sooners sort of exerted their force on this vote. I mean, it's pretty clear that uh, OU was not happy with that vote and said, hey, let's rethink this. I have no idea what kind of cards Oklahoma played in that meeting room with the faculty reps. But, uh, you know, the Sooners have some power in the Big 12, and we saw that with this vote. You go to the SEC, you go to the Big 10, you're not going to have that kind of power. You're not going to have that kind of influence. So there are all kinds of things to think about when you're going to think about leaving a conference. Well, this is where I put in my week league plug for my Kansas State Wildcats, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg that you guys not destroy the conference. <laughs> uh, speaking of coming back, there's also questions uh, surrounding, of course, KD's future here in Oklahoma City. You had a column this week that said, this is really a done deal, and he'll be back. I think it's 98%. I can't imagine a scenario by which Durant doesn't re-sign with the, with the Thunder. To me, it's just a question of does he sign a one-year contract, which would make a really to his financial ad, uh, advantage, or does he just say, listen, I'm all in. Here's a four- or five-year contract. Let's up and, and let's start getting serious. So he's a loyal guy. He talks about people. He's never done anything, said anything to make you think he wants to get out on the market. So. I think, uh, I think uh, this is uh, something he has to do. He has to go through the process. If for no other reason, the players' union will demand that he at least go out there and, uh, and see what's out there and, and uh, do some negotiating. They, they don't want people just automatically re-upping with their teams. It, it keeps prices down. So uh, I think Kevin will go through the process. He'll talk to some people. But I think in the end, he's going to stay with the Thunder. But are we going to be going through this whole thing again possibly next Summer. Well, I, that's the problem, and that's why I think the Thunder will will try to get Kevin to sign a three, four, five year contract and say, "Hey, let's uh, let's get serious about this. We've got we've got future contracts: Serge Ibaka, Russell Westbrook. Next summer they're up. Hey, let's go ahead and get you in. They'll jump on board. We won't have to mess with this. We won't have to go through this. The truth is, Durant handled this season of questioning and this question this season of uncertainty. He handled it pretty well." But it couldn't have been comfortable. He didn't enjoy it. I think, he'd, I think he would prefer to go through uh, a season in which, uh, hey, no more questions, just trying to win basketball games is all that's on the table. I, what I'm saying is I think it's a possibility that he would sign a longer-term contract. Now, I'm in the minority on that. Most people say it's automatic. He's going to sign a one-year deal. But I think it's possible that he could sign longer. Great. Okay, Adam, we've had a lot of uh – News this week in the energy industry, um, oil's creeping up near $50 a barrel, but it, there's still a lot of pain being felt by a lot of people in that industry. Uh, we had a story this week from Brianna Bailey about the folks out in Elk City. Um, What's the word out there? What's the latest from Elk City? Well, you're, you're right. Uh, the low oil prices over the past two years have been hard for, for the, the whole industry throughout the region, throughout Oklahoma. Uh, lost uh, about, about 20,000 jobs statewide. 
Um, in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, a lot of those jobs have been absorbed by other industries. Out in rural parts of the state, it's, it's harder to do that. Uh, Elk City area has lost about 1,200 jobs over the last uh, year and a half. It's hard for a community that size to absorb that many jobs. So yeah, it's definitely, it's affecting housing, it's affecting uh, industrial development, it's affecting that the city has put in place uh, the last several years when prices were higher, when the industry was going stronger, the industry put it, or the city put in place things to bring in more industry to be able to continue to grow. And now just as they were starting to get that going, the industry's dried up and, and it, it's definitely hurt the community. And Elk City is of course used to the boom bust cycle. I think we were out there a couple years ago talking to him in, in the boom part of the cycle and remember the mayor at that time saying, we're not going to make the same mistakes we made in the past. We're going to, we're going to put stuff in place that when, the, when we know that the next downturn comes, we'll be ready. They just didn't quite have enough time to get it all in place yet? I, I think that's right. I think that's fair. I think that uh, they, uh, they did, you're right, they made, they made a, a, a point to invest in in parks, to invest in uh, water uh, uh, resources for the community, to invest in a, a big industrial park, things that are, are more than just energy, uh, things that would allow the community to continue to grow. Uh, probably a good plan, probably a good idea. Uh, nobody expected this downturn to be as deep of, as of, of a downturn it is. I mean, this is the longest uh, lasting uh, bear market in the inter energy industry for at least 30 years. Uh, that for a lot of reasons, it's not is not as widespread. It's not as deep as, as it was in the '80s, but it's the worst we've seen since then. And and so that 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 kind of uh, a hit is hard for a community like Elk, Elk City or, or many other rural parts of Oklahoma to absorb. What's the anticipation for oil prices at this point for the rest of the year? They have been climbing steadily. Uh, we we hit a 12-year low, $26 in February. It's up. Uh, it's been hovering right under $50 uh, in the last uh, week or so. Uh, that's definitely an improvement. It's much, pe people in the industry are feeling much better today than they were four months ago. But it's still, two years ago, it was $100. We're nowhere near that. What's it going to take to get Elk City back on its feet? Uh, for the drilling, uh, Elk City's a drilling community. Uh, they had 30 rigs going, and, and then those have, those have gone away. Uh, companies are saying that at 50, 55, 60, they'll start feeling comfortable. But it's probably not going to be until prices are 60 or more that drilling activity really starts picking up. And most people I'm hearing are saying uh, it's probably not going to be steady at 60 until into next into this year or well into next year. Uncomfortable times in the oil industry. Also uncomfortable times at the legislature, maybe for some incumbents, right? We have the uh, primaries are coming up. We've got candidates for office uh, and we have an unprecedented number of challengers. Yeah, that's right. This is an election year uh, for every House seat, half of the state Senate. So now that the uh, uh, legislative session has come to an end uh, for many legislators, it's uh, full campaign mode. Now, what's interesting going into the primary that takes place on June 28th is we have 32 incumbents that face a primary challenge. So someone within their party that is trying to unseat them. Uh, that That's a, a really high number compared to what we've seen in the past. Uh, in 2014, the last election cycle, just 13 incumbents were challenged. Before that, in uh, 2012, uh, we saw 17. Uh, overall, this is the we have the highest number of candidates filing for House and Senate seats since 2004, when uh, term limits started to impact uh, legislative races. And so, um, a variety of reasons for that. We've seen quite a few educators run uh, 30 to 40 uh, members of the so-called teacher caucus. These are teachers or are former teachers that are, are running on a campaign of increasing education funding and teacher salaries, um, and that's in both parties. Um, but just uh, you know, other other issues abound as well, and just kind of. A a, a general um, sentiment among many in the state that uh, you know the legislature can do better and uh, we're seeing a lot of primary challenges uh, that are stating that. How about in the metro area, Ben? Who are some of the names that we might see uh, that are drawing a, a candidate yeah. in their own party? Well, we have a few examples of incumbents that are facing challenges. Uh, Mustang, South Oklahoma City, that district, uh, Senator Kyle Loveless uh, is facing a challenge um, um, from two other Republicans. Uh, this is a Republican-leaning district, so the winner of this primary will most likely uh, go on to win in the general. Uh, now, while there are a lot of incumbents that are facing challenges, the one thing to keep in mind, it's not easy to beat an incumbent. In fact, over the last two election cycles, only one of 30 challengers to an incumbent was successful. So the odds are still in the incumbent's favor, name recognition, a bigger war chest, all those normal factors. Uh, when it comes to the primary election, though, some interesting storylines will be uh, which Republican emerges maybe in uh, 
um, uh, House District with Cindy Munson, which is House District 85, the Democrat that was able to steal that seat. Uh, Republicans want it back real bad, and so there's a handful of Republicans that are running in that primary to see who can contest her in November. On the flip side, House District 87, uh, Representative Jason Nelson, who's not running for re-election. Uh, this is a district that ha the Democrats have performed better in each year over the last few cycles. Um, Colin Walkie, who ran against Nelson and lost uh, two years ago, is running another Democratic challenger in that primary. Uh, and so this is a seat that uh, Democrats are, are hopeful that maybe they can steal. And that would really be, uh, you know, picking up maybe an urban seat or two would really be a victory for the Democrats. There's no risk of a, of, of a shift in power. The Republicans have a supermajority that's going to stay in place uh, for the foreseeable future. But the Democrats are trying to show that uh, in some of these, uh, especially these urban districts that are starting to trend a little bit more uh, left, that, uh, that they can be successful there. Yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a active and uh, uh, volatile campaign, yes. I would say this this fall for the uh, for the uh, Oklahoma legislature. Well, those are all the headlines we have for this week. Uh, be sure to check uh, the Sunday paper for Ben's story on the legislative races, and we will see you again next week. Thanks so much for joining us.